In early November, I was packing up boxes, getting ready to move into a new apartment when I got the news that my grandmother passed away. My partner painted walls in LA while I buried my grandmother in Michigan. I felt bad being away from them, but I was happy to be with my mom. Her and my grandma had been really close, and I guess one day that'll be me helping my mom at the end of her life. I spent most of my time at home going through old photos, picking out ones of my grandma for the funeral. My childhood bedroom had long been converted into an office for my mother's online clothes flipping business, so I lied awake on the couch until 3am because of the time change and the jet lag. To help my partner feel less alone, or maybe to make me feel less alone, I sent them Grubhub every night at the new apartment while they lost it to paint fumes and spackle. But anyways, I was eager to get back and settle into the new place. Spirited Away is one of my comfort movies. The color palettes of blacks and grays and peaches and pinks and golds are just beautiful. And I've always loved Chihiro. I have a pet peeve for children characters that are written unrealistically, but Chihiro reminds me of the little girls I used to babysit, or maybe the one that I used to be. Loud about her feelings, loud in general. I'm not leaving till you give me a job! Scared but brave, and sometimes feeling an overwhelming sense of being alone. Chihiro begins the film angry at her parents because the family is moving. Sad that she has to leave her old school, her friends, her old life. And when Chihiro steps into the spirit world, everything changes. She's thrust into this new, unknown world that echoes her anxieties at the beginning of the film. The theme park changes into a bathhouse. Her parents change into pigs. Even her name is changed, and we learn that in this world it's even possible to lose your name completely, as if it's possible to lose your entire sense of self. The fear of the dark corners of this new world is that fear of change. Chihiro, in all her abilities, weaknesses, curiosities, and strengths, does her best to deal with one of the scariest types of change. Change that comes from an outside source. Change from beyond our control. And I'm in love with how Chihiro handles it. She's brave in the face of monsters. Just a minute, sir. She's persistent. Please, can't you give me a job? Don't start that again and kind, and even makes new friends while surviving in a strange, hostile world. She doesn't mask her feelings of sadness or loneliness like many unfeeling, too perfect fantasy characters. If anything, she leads with her emotions. She misses her parents, and she messes up, and through her struggle, she finds that she's stronger, braver, and more adaptable than she ever knew. Jihiro is someone who was thrown into the abyss and, instead of losing herself, became more of herself because of it. She became deeper and bigger and stronger, and I feel like that's the best case scenario when our parents change into pigs. I've always been fascinated with change. When I was young, I would change outfits three to four times a day, depending on my mood, trashing my room in the process. Probably because I grew up in a sleepy town that I couldn't wait to escape. When things become too stagnant, I start to feel claustrophobic. I need things to be moving, to be happening. Sometimes I'll even abandon projects before I should just to get the ball rolling on something else. But change to me has always meant possibility. It's always been exciting, and without it, I feel like I'm drowning. Some types of change do scare me, though, like people leaving me or losing friends makes me sweat. Maybe I love career changes because it means progress, but personal changes scare me because I love the people in my life. I don't know, that is for my therapist to figure out. All to say, whether we like it or not, change is something that we're always surrounded by. One thing that I cannot stand is being forced to sit still for too long. Ah, Jean-Luc Picard. By far my favorite Jean-Luc. My least favorite being, obviously, Jean-Luc Godard. Not because I don't think he's great, but because his films do exactly what he wants them to do, which is alienate me, and I hate it. I remember sitting in film class watching Weekend and just feeling my skin crawl. Whenever the actors looked directly into camera, I wanted to riot. It's my gut reaction. I want to be sucked into the fictional world of a film, and the fact that he actively denies me that experience, it feels personal, Godard. One of the most infuriating scenes that I actually think is genius and beautiful is the long take of the car crash. It is one long tracking shot where Godard shows a traffic jam, and it's a car after 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 car. A few minutes into the scene, I remember whispering to my friend that if this goes on one second more, I'm going to throw up, and then it went on for six minutes longer. I don't know why Godard films give me such a visceral reaction, but this scene, I think, unsettles me for the exact reason Godard created this unsettling sequence. You can't escape. We are used to being sutured into a film's narrative. 
We're used to continuous cuts in films, the rhythms of shot reverse shot that are so comforting. It's the language of mainstream film that we all understand sometimes without even realizing we're understanding it because it's a language we're surrounded by since the first time we locked eyes on a screen as a young child. But this shot, it's unchanging. I feel trapped forever watching this unending carnage and the camera as an extension of me, the viewer, can't pull away. Godard won't let me pull away from the actor staring right at me from the moving image. I mean, I guess I could have left the theater. Oh wait, I can't because it was for class and we were supposed to take notes. I couldn't rip my eyes away from this art piece like I could in a museum, running around from exhibit to exhibit to try and fit as many Monets as I can until it was time to grab lunch in an okay overpriced cafe. And the shot clearly recalls news footage from Vietnam, where the public was able to see the unending horror and scope of the war for the first time on the nightly news. If you didn't want to see those images, you could just change the channel, but we couldn't change the shot. We can't cut to something else. We can't intervene. The sameness in that shot brings me back to my fear of stagnation. This eight minute long scene is just a perfect horror movie made specifically for me. And it brings up all the feelings I get when I'm on my seventh day back in Michigan and I feel like I'm gonna drown in the wonderful tourist trap that is Silver Beach. My grandma used to say that anytime she was visited by a cardinal, it was someone coming from the past to say hello. Since my grams passed away, my mom was doing her best to deal with that monumental external change. And as much as losing my grandma hurt, it meant that I got to be there for my mom in one of the hardest times of her life. And for the first time ever, instead of my mom taking care of me, I got to take care of my mom. Through all the painting and the laundry and the moving and the funeral, I've been watching a lot of hoarders. What struck me about hoarders was that in each episode, a person is faced with the reality that if they don't change their entire habits, outlook, and worldview, they could die. Which sounds easy to some, I'm sure. Oh, I'm gonna die? Literally anything to avoid that. But that's just not the case. Hoarders really shows how hard it is for some people to change. Rez Goddard was playing with withholding change and Jahiro is dealing with change from external forces. In Hoarders, it's the individuals who need to change. It's all on that one person, which is a really, really hard thing to do, no matter how many family members show up or how many extra crew members the show hires to clean out the house. They need to confront whatever emotional trauma has triggered this behavior. I tried to clean it, but it won't let me. Some of the people on Hoarders are able to break through their disorder and change on a dime. And some end up chasing out the camera crew, shutting out their families who care for them, and the disorder wins. Each individual and circumstance is so different, and most of them hoard after experiencing extreme trauma, so I'm not here to judge those who are able to overcome their hoarding or not. Only to point out that this is one of the most tangible examples I've seen of the difficulty of dealing with that ever-present change, even when your life is on the line. On the show, they say that the average person does the same thing that a hoarder does when faced with trauma, but instead of building up literal walls, we build up walls inside of our heads. We block people out, put up defenses so we don't have to deal. People who hoard just happen to physically manifest those walls in reality, shielding themselves from whatever it is they're afraid of, whatever they want to forget or deny. But the thing is, as much as some of these hoarders are able to convince themselves that they're preventing change or that they're in control of their home as it fills with books or trash or moldy clothes or other potentially hazardous waste, they aren't stopping change. At best, they're just slowing down change and at worst, they're just protecting themselves from witnessing the outside world change. Hoarding doesn't stop change, it just lets the hoarder affect the type of change that their lives are undergoing. Their relationships disintegrate, fade away, or end in explosive confrontations with family members, while their home environment slowly decays, slowly changing into a death trap. They see these piles of trash as precious things that they're preserving, as treasured memories that they won't admit are disintegrating right before their eyes. No matter how much a hoarder convinces themselves that they've managed to freeze time and place, that everything they care about is here, and that everything they care about will always be here, safely hidden away within the walls, change continues. My mom and I are like two Chihiros, dealing with something out of our control. And when someone passes away, there's absolutely nothing that you can do to bring them back. That's a change that you just have to learn to deal with. It's something that you can't turn away from, no matter how unsettling or uncomfortable it makes you. Maybe it's tempting to put up emotional walls or real walls to deny that some things are just out of our control. Maybe it's tempting to go so far into that denial to abstract your feelings so completely that you end up arguing we need to build a literal wall around our country. But we can't stop change, and I don't wanna stop change. 
I want to work with change to make things better. Change is literally what our entire universe is predicated on, from the constant changing biology and chemistry in every cell in our body, to birth and death, to politics and culture, to evolution. And at least for me, yeah, it can be really scary. But change can also mean hope. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you don't miss my next video. And thanks to my patrons who make these videos possible, especially for supporting me when I do something a little different like this one. If you'd like to support, head over to patreon.com slash Maggie Mayfish. And until next time, save Martha.